Good morning, class. Good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. As we continue our teaching in this incredible book that God's given us, uh, it's amazing how God was definitely thinking ahead, wasn't He? On giving us a book to follow. I like to uh, start a lot of times the session with a quote or a thought uh, to get our brains in gear and can get us going on here. And I do don't want to skip over our online audience. We're so thankful you're with us. Thank you for being with us today. Pray that you'll be able to receive something from this body of Christ here at New Life. So we're studying the book of Acts. Today we'll be in Lesson 12 and in Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is a, it takes a little more time to get through Chapter 2. It is the foundation for the rest of the book of what's taking place and what's going on. There's a lot established. In Chapter 2 we have the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but we also have a great sermon, we call it, preached by Peter to the nation Israel in Acts chapter 2, which spawns the rest of the book of Acts and what happens and what takes place. After Acts 2, it starts getting into specifics and particulars. But Acts 2 sets the foundation for the rest of the book of what's happening and uh, what's going on. I have this little quote here by Derek Prince. Prayer is limitless. It's our intercontinental ballistic missile. We can launch it from anywhere and make it reach anywhere. Derek Prince. Prayer. I am, there's no doubt in my mind as we, a hundred years from now we'll have more understanding about the significance of prayer. It's obvious that prayer is a, a spiritual exercise, if you will. It's a, it's a phenomena of the spirit world. Uh, because we must understand other people pray other than Christians. Right? Muslims pray. Other people pray. So we understand that prayer is a movement and an action that affects the spiritual world. So as Christians, we understand that uh, prayer has a meaning, but it is also, prayer is a, I guess you could say almost a generic term, to moving and, and changing and pushing into the spiritual realm. If that be the case, the, uh, as Christians, we cannot spare a single prayer. We need all the prayers that God's called us to pray to influence uh, the spiritual world. And we'll see more of this even in the uh, book of Acts as we continue. Now for your uh, learning as we pick up again here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 12, I've, uh, the last two to three weeks I've had different, uh, I've been shedding a little bit of revelation on this one verse. And uh, is it... Uh, Perhaps we're going to hang beef in here today. Is it a little cool or is it just me? <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. I, mean, I didn't know if anybody had been deer hunting was going to hang some deer in here or something. All right, we got somebody checking that out. I see people covering up with blankets and, and, uh, and then I, I didn't think much of it until I felt compelled to go steal the blankets. So <laughs> perhaps we can. Okay, Acts 2 and uh, verse 12 here. It says, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? And I hit one aspect of, of, uh, of the amazement and doubt last week. Well, last two weeks I've hit two different uh, uh, revelations that go with uh, this. And I'm going to give another one today. And it says they were amazed and they were uh, in doubt. So we see that in the movement of the Spirit... When God, uh, there, there is such thing as the presence of God. 
There is such thing as the presence of God within and the presence of God without. And we have the presence, you know, the presence of God is bigger than just you. But God allows us uh, a portion of His presence of Christ within us. But God's bigger than all that too. So we see that the presence of God is, is also without. And then a lot of times we have a meeting of the presence of God within and without and they come together. And it tends to produce a, a, a spiritual dynamic that causes uh, humanity uh, to act different than they normally would. Now, uh, another th- I'm, not, I'm not saying just in weird things. I'm saying it'll cause you to not sin. Uh, there again, I'm saying that's something that you would not normally do. You know, when the presence of God within and without stay uh, plugged in, and uh, there's a t- connection that keeps running there, then it helps us to walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit. And uh, I want to show in this verse today how there is a difference in the mind or the head and the heart. Now, so let's just, and I'm not going to stay here long, it's just a little uh, another take on amazed and in doubt. When God shows up there is always amazement and doubt, and we covered that last week also and the week before. But there again, with this amazement and doubt, another aspect, uh, with amazement and doubt, it says, now this is in verse 12, and they were all amazed and they were in doubt. So this is where they started speaking in tongues. They all heard what was being spoken in their own language. And so no doubt they were amazed. Uh, but also you need to understand, and I mentioned this also, that why tongues? Well, uh, tongues had been issued at the Tower of Babel to disperse. Here we see that God through His Holy Spirit brings all of that aright again. And He hears, and everybody gets to hear in their own language the same thing. So we see that God's combating this Babylonian spirit and He's showing us an aspect of the Holy Spirit that can combat the Babylonian spirit. What we're living in today is Babylon. And the Holy Spirit is the, this is speaking about tongues, but it's talking about understanding. It says they all understood in their own language. So it's as, it's as much about hearing as it is speaking. But the point being is the Holy Spirit is here to aid us in this uh, time of Babylon, if you will, or this time of confusion, if you will, of all the tongues and all the languages. There's a lot of confusion out here. But it's through the power of His Holy Spirit that we as believers do not need to be confused. That is the spiritual point also. But it says that they were amazed, but they were also in doubt. So I want us to look at this just a little closer. Amazement comes from the heart, and doubt comes from the mind. Now the Scripture says that we believe in our heart. Jesus refers to the heart. Scripture refers to the heart. So what is the heart? Is it the physical heart is speaking about the heart of man. That's the center of the seed of the soul of man and the spirit of man is referred to as the heart. Well that is not the same thing as the mind. It's the heart and the mind is not the same thing. You are not your mind, you just have one. Okay? And so, but now you are your heart is, is, is who you are. So the Scriptures start showing us a distinction here. And I want you to consider this with this one verse this morning before we move on into the book of Acts. And with that, amazement comes from the heart. Doubt comes from the mind or the head. Now, in Mark eleven twenty three, 23 it says this, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, y'all know the verse, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Pretty big statement, right? A pretty concerning verse. Uh, It's a big bold statement that's being made here. But I want us to 
uh, to look at it and to to view what this verse is saying. Let's break it apart just a little bit. Perhaps we can understand it better. He says, whosoever shall, whosoever shall, uh, shall not doubt in his heart. Okay, you see there. Okay, now I, I said to you uh, that doubt is in the mind. Here the Scripture says, shall not doubt in his heart. So what's his, what is it referring to? That you can see a movement of God and be amazed and have doubt. It's because the doubt's in the mind, the amazement's in the heart. But when the doubt of the mind falls into the heart, are you with me? You see, doubt in the mind does not hinder faith. There's nothing wrong with that. Doubt of the mind does not hinder faith. Faith comes from the heart, not the mind. So when doubt falls from the head into the heart, now you've got to catch this. There's a huge problem. Now here's the problem. I want you to see it. <clears throat> and believe those things which he shall uh, say shall come to pass. To believe those things that he, in other words, it's the things that God says. When you have doubt on the things that God say, when do you have, when, this is addressing the problem of doubt of the heart, not doubt of the mind. Okay? Faith is not in the mind. It's not intellectual. Faith is of the heart, the soul of man. When doubt falls into your soul, then we got a problem. Temptation and all happens in the mind, then it drops to the heart if you embrace it. Just because you're tempted to the mind, just let it stay there. Now, <clears throat> which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have. You see that? So it starts with whosoever doubt in his heart believes on those things which he saith, he shall have. It says shall not doubt of the heart, I should say. Shall not doubt of the heart. So I want you to watch this. Jesus says we must believe it in our heart. How do we know if we are believing in the heart? Now that's, that's the next question. So we know that the amazement happens in the heart. We're at the awe of God. But at the same time we can hold some doubt. Somebody gets healed and we're like, wow, it's amazing. But at the same time, oh, did that really happen? That's the argument with the mind, with the spirit. It's not a big deal. Faith is not stored in the mind. Faith is stored in the heart. But doubt by the enemy is trying to fall into the heart. Then, we, then we've got an illness. We've got a problem, if you can see uh, what I'm saying here. And so, Jesus says that we believe in the heart. How do we know if we're believing in the heart? So we believe in the heart. Now, here, here's the problem. I want you to see this. There's two or three different aspects I can go here, but I have one particular one I'm interested in showing this morning. How do we know if we're believing from the heart? It's by our words. How do you know what's in your heart? It's by the words that you speak. It's by the words that you speak. So how, what's in your heart? Yet, now where did I say that faith is? Faith is in the heart. So what the enemy is trying to do is get you to doubt, get that doubt to drop down into your heart where faith is stored. And then this stuff of doubt comes out of your mouth and it's inspired by faith. Anybody catch what I just said? Then we've got a problem. The enemy's trying to capture your faith for his works. This is the battle of the mind. This is the spiritual warfare. I want you to consider. It says this in Matthew 12, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. 
So out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, as an example, uh, I think there's people in the Word of Faith camp that take this, I'll say, to an extreme, even though I'm not too sure you can. Uh, there, the Word of uh, Faith camp is criticized, trying to say that things are as though they're not. But we cannot escape the fact that what comes out of the mouth comes out of the heart, and what comes out of the heart is being, is faith is being added to it. So faith is power. So there's power in your words. Uh, for instance, we can all go around and confess how sick we are. No doubt we're not, we are sick. But we can constantly go around giving a report to everybody. Normally you don't stand in the mirror and look at yourself and constantly complain on how sick you are. Usually the complaints of how sick you are is to others. The part I'm wanting you to consider is out of the abundance of the heart things are spoken and their added faith, faith has been added to it. And so therefore, the sickness and illness maybe should last 24 hours and you're still into it into two or three weeks. But it's because of the confession of the mouth added with faith that's keeping it alive. Now just test what I'm saying. But I want you to consider it. Because when doubt, as I was showing you here, when doubt, if it's in the mind, and this is through word study that I've come to this conclusion. This doubt when in the mind really doesn't hurt a lot. Because faith is in the heart. You can be amazed and have doubt at the same time. But when doubt falls from the brain to the heart, and it'll make the heart sick, but the heart is where faith is stored. And so then out of the heart, how do I know what's in my heart it comes out of the abundance of my words? It's then put in it's put into motion. And so these words of doubt have actually been energized through faith. That's dangerous. That's just dangerous. Can I hear a little bit of a witness? Amen. Amen. That's, it's just dangerous. Now consider what I'm saying and even test it. I don't have any problems with that. But I'm saying some of us have got a 24-hour cold that's lasted for two or three weeks. It's because I'm suggesting it's because we constantly are confessing our sickness and our illness, not to ourselves, but to everybody else. And based on our own faith, we keep the thing rolling and going. Now, I believe I deliver that to you by the witness of the Holy Spirit. You test it. Don't leave from here and I say that all illnesses are done that way. But I am suggesting that the Scripture is showing me that doubt, when it's in my mind, I can have any illness. And doubt's trying to fall into the place of my heart. Can you hear what I'm saying? And when this doubt falls into my heart, then I can make a constant confession of this. To see, the, the, the words based off of doubt, which is not the word of the Lord, by the way. But what the enemy has no power, according to this book. So somewhere or another, it has to steal its anointing and power. And the way He steals it is through us. He steals our own faith, our own anointing, our own power. And we need to understand the way it's communicated, the way it's launched is through our words. Our words make a difference, make a huge difference. And so I can either make a confession off of my doubt or I can make a confession off the Word of God. Right? And so when I see my friends and my neighbors, how are you doing? If my confession is the Word of God, I venture to wager that your recovery time's cut to a tenth. I venture to wager that versus a constant confession. Have you ever said, 
this thing just keeps hanging on. I can't get rid of it. I just seems like I can never get rid of it. It just keeps hanging on. It's like I go from one sickness to the next, next one. Anybody ever said that? I go from one to the next, from one to the next. I'm just bringing a suggestion. You test it. Perhaps we need to change the confession of our words and not use this doubt that's in our brain. Let it fall to our heart. How do you, you see, you've got to understand, before it comes out the mouth, it has to go to the heart. It's out of the heart that these words are spoken. But it's in the heart is where the faith is stored, is given to us. And so we have total faith in our sickness to continue. And we confess it to our friends on how bad we're feeling all the time. Right? Now what I've just said to you could be full of hogwash. Or it could be the truth of the Spirit. You test it and get back to me. The only problem is if you come back to me in two weeks and say, well, Alan, I still got it. Well, I'm probably going to think you didn't get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I felt to share that as another, uh, to expound just a little more on what, the, what is saying in Greek. And also going back to Hebrew words here, what is he really saying? And, I, and I'm, I'm very honest with you. Uh, it clocked me personally. Uh, it reminded, I mean, I've been taught what I just said before, but for some reason the Lord gave me a huge refresher course in another deep dive again. Uh, evidently I've been guilty of what I just expressed to you, or the Lord would not have made of such great emphasis to me to study. So you can be thankful for my sin. That was a joke. Okay. Here we go. So it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So just, uh, so it speaks about the heart, shall not doubt in his heart, and I've explained all of that. Faith is in our heart, and what we say has faith applied to it. We need to always remember that. You can say, but Alan, I'm just giving an honest report. The only thing I can tell you is some reports don't need to be made. I don't care how honest they are. Some of them we just need to let fall to the ground. Because we need to understand our faith is applied to it. <laughs> so, I think I've labored that one enough. So, as we go on into Peter's sermon in Acts 2, jumping over here to verse 13, others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken. He says, hearken to my words. So Peter's sermon answers their question, which is in the previous verse. What does this mean? What meaneth this uh, in verse 12? In this sermon, and I want you to understand, this is a sermon of Peter. And as we get on over into Acts 2, Acts 2 is known for the outpouring of the Spirit. But there's more to Acts 2 than just the prophecy of Joel. There's a lot more to it that we'll look into. So in this sermon you can see the filling of the Holy Spirit comes upon Peter. Now in 14 and 15 we start the Peter's sermon which he will recite uh, uh, the prophecy here. But Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. Now he makes an emphasis here, ye men of Judea. So that gives us an idea of the audience that he's specifically speaking to. At this point in time in Acts 2, Peter is addressing basically the nation Israel. Now here's what I want you to see though. In the book of Acts, it's what we call a transitional book. In the book of Acts, up to the book of Acts, God's dealing with the nation Israel. God's going to speak to Israel to speak to the world what God wants the world to know. In the book of Acts, we see God expanding prophecy. He starts expanding it. 
you'll start seeing some things that I'm going to show you that God starts saying things to Israel, but also we start noticing He's saying it to a broader audience than just Israel. Understanding now that's breaking prophecy to a Jew. If you're a Jew, the reason some of these things are hard to understand because it's going outside of the prophetic word. That's the reason we call the book of Acts a transitional book. God starts speaking things that broadens the scope. Now, so here though in Acts 2 we see that it's kind of held to the men of Judea. Peter's preaching. Acts 2 is a sermon. Peter's preaching basically to the nation Israel. Peter is addressing Jews. His whole presentation is directed to them. Now in Acts 2.16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is not the total fulfillment of the prophecy, but the beginning. So Peter's saying, this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. He didn't say, this is all that. He said, this is that. He has begun, it has begun, not being totally fulfilled. We are actually still in this prophecy. That's what I mean by that. It was introduced then. It is still up and running even today. But it's not been fulfilled. Had it been fulfilled, it wouldn't still be running. Right? Okay. This is that, he says. He does not say this is like that. He says this is that. So that's a specific marking in time when this is that. That's a specific marking of time. The prophecies of Joel in Acts 2.20 were not and have not been fulfilled. That's the reason I say they're still running. The prophecy has only begun and is still active. That's the reason people say, well, God poured out His Spirit. It's when you get into uh, sensation, cessationism, it says that the sign gifts are not active today. Uh, there's a, there's a problem with that. And the problem is, is this prophecy, the sign gifts have to be active today until this prophecy is fulfilled. It has to be active. Well, we know it hasn't been fulfilled. The last of this prophecy hasn't happened. Even though, uh, what's the date of tomorrow? The 8th? Well, it could be fulfilled on the 8th. I don't know. Uh, that's kind of a joke. <laughs> yeah, the eclipse, okay. Uh, maybe it's fulfilled tomorrow. Uh, who, who, who knows? Uh, but that's another thing, like the eclipse. Everybody's saying the eclipse this and the eclipse that. Uh, and do I think that the eclipse is a sign in the heavens? The answer is yes. I definitely think it's a sign, but we've also had a. In other words, what happens is. If the end doesn't, if the fulfillment of this prophecy doesn't end tomorrow with this eclipse, here's what you can know. That the grace of God is holding back the fulfillment even yet. You see, see each time you have this happen, is it a sign? Of, yeah, it is. People say, well, is it a sign of the end? Well, yeah, and every other time. It's been a sign of the end. But you need to understand, we are living in an interim time, a parenthesis. We are living in a time of the grace of God, which was a secret, which was a mystery. Nobody saw it coming, and nobody will know when it ends. But that's when we're living in this interim grace period of God. So we're going to have another eclipse. If nothing happens and we're still here next Sunday, know for sure. Nobody missed it. It's God's grace said, not yet. Not yet. But now there's going to be one that God's going to say, okay, we're going. You've got to understand the heavens, everything in prophecy constantly has to keep being fulfilled. It constantly, just like I've told you before, there's always been an Antichrist in every generation. Because Satan doesn't know when God says this is it. 
So there's a lot of Antichrist in hell wondering why they weren't it. They're probably down there arguing who was the best Antichrist. <laughs> Satan doesn't know. So when you look at the signs in the heavens, could this be it? Yeah, it, it, this could be it. Is that one of the signs? It's a sign. You don't need to argue. But is this the sign when God pulls the plug? Ask me Tuesday. <laughs> if not, I just want you to understand, rejoice that God's grace is still holding because He says the times of the Gentiles is yet to be filled. But now when she's full, you'll know it. Okay? That's all. I know everybody gets upset about the, I mean, they've got National Guard coming, they've got everything. There sure is a lot of activity out of non-believers that don't believe in it. <laughs> So I want you to understand that because it says in Acts 2.20, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord comes. So is tomorrow, and it's kind of amazing that tomorrow's happening and I'm teaching this the day before. I'm sure coincidence. And uh, <clears throat> so, I, but I don't want you to be mistaken. Tomorrow is a sign in the heavens by God. It, it definitely is. And it is a marker. It, it's, it's not by happenstance. It's just not something that means nothing. It means everything. But please take to heart that the day of grace that we're in, that if, if God holds back His wrath, it's because He has some people yet He wants to receive the gospel to fill up the heavenlies with that's on this planet. And it's just like our, my days are numbered on this earth. Your days are numbered. Did you know that? And the day of grace is numbered. When my days are full, I'm going home. When the days of grace are full, the wrath of God comes and there's a lot going somewhere. All right. So it says that great and notable day of the Lord come. It implies that the remainder uh, uh, would be fulfilled when Israel repents, as we see in Acts 3, uh, 19, 23. So what happens is we got this outpouring of the Spirit. It has happened. Prophesy, he says that you're, you'll dream dreams and you prophesy. All of this stuff, is it in effect today? The answer is yes. And all of this will continue until Israel repents. Now we all sitting here know that Israel is not repented. Right? They, they've not repented. And so therefore, when the repentance comes, then this prophecy is concluded. But it hasn't had repentance, so therefore I know that it's still running. Okay, here we go. We'll look at it in Acts 3. And here's what it says. This is Peter in Acts 3. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, talking to the nation Israel. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Times of refreshing is talking about the second coming of Christ. And He shall send Jesus, see it, which before was preached unto you, which they did and rejected, whom the heavens must receive, you see that, until the times of restitution of all things. So there's going to be a times of restitution of all things. This is this day of grace. Things are being restored restitution restored. There's not a full restitution until Israel repents of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you and your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever ye shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. And that's talking about the tribulation period. So what happens is we, this is the murder indictment, if you will, that Peter preached to the nation Israel, to Judea. Now, the conclusion of Joel's prophecy is when Israel repents, which what does repentance looks like? They receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah. I don't, uh, uh, and so that's what we're looking for. We know that Israel hasn't yet. 
A lot of people are excited about Israel building the third temple and giving uh, sacrifice to the red heifer. I'm telling you, that still means they haven't repented. That's what that means. It's an abomination, actually. And the Antichrist will rule and reign from there. Israel will put the Antichrist even in and support him. Then all of a sudden they'll see their sin. And here we go. So, so you, there again you've got to understand, the seven years tribulation is because Israel's not repenting. Tribulation comes, the, the tribula, if you can handle this, the tribulation period is to purify the nation Israel. Yes. Yes. It's the wrath of God comes against the nation Israel for rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. I know that's heavy, but it's Bible. Now, so the repentance of Israel is the end of tribulation, and here we go. Okay. Now, here's Peter quoting Joel again in verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see vision, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my head maintenance I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. Peter is explaining what Jesus predicted. It's exactly what Jesus predicted. He is not implying that the total prophecy was fulfilled on this day, but it included that which they had seen just happen, which was they were speaking in tongues and they heard in their own. The cosmic events stated at the end of this prophecy would signify the conclusion of this prophecy. You see that? So do I get excited even about that? I do. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I do. I feel in my spirit that the fullness of the Gentiles is not over. I just feel that. Doesn't mean anything, I guess. This phenomena of the outpouring of the Spirit will continue until the total fulfillment is complete. So we're living in this time of this prophecy. Now the gifts are still here today. Uh, this says this in John 14, 17, Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you, he says. You cannot separate the Holy Spirit from his gifts. You see, you can't say the, Holy, the gifts of the Spirit have ceased if the Holy Spirit is still here. <laughs> the math won't work. <laughs> It's, it just won't work. And the cessationists believe that these gifts have ceased, but yet they say the Holy Spirit's here. So you're telling the Holy Spirit you're here, but your hands are tied. No, you can't work, but you're here. Glad you're watching us. Right? I mean, it, the, as, as I say, the math just doesn't work. It's just not true. There will be a time that the gifts aren't here. I personally believe it's when the rapture of the church takes place. One reason the rapture of the church takes place is because the Holy Spirit and His gifts are taken out. Amen. And then you go into the tribulation period and then you start reading the Scriptures. You have to endure to the end to be saved. Jesus even says that, but He's referring to the seven year tribulation period. Now, so you, you just can't separate the Holy Spirit and the gifts. Anytime somebody tries to do that, it did he make common sense, much less biblical sense? The gifts will vanish away when Jesus returns, for we shall be like him, so our gifts that are in part will vanish. Ah. See, our gifts now are in part. Tongues and everything, it's all in part. So he says, we're doing all this in part with these gifts. But he says, when that which is perfect comes, which is his coming after us, than that which is in, we won't need gifts when we're like Him. Amen. We got the totality, we're not in part anymore. We're in fullness. Do you like that? Yeah. Now, but we need to understand this in 1 Corinthians. Charity never fails, but whether there be prophets, they shall fail. There be tongues, they shall cease. Where there be knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So when Jesus comes after us at the rapture of the church, that's when that which is in part is done away. But now here's the key. He says, since you, since you guys are operating in part, he says your love for each other is going to have to be greater than your gifts. 
because you're operating in partners. You got that? Your love's got to be greater than your gift. Because you're operating in partners, and we all understand, all right, we're doing this kind of darkly, but we're doing the best we can. And Jesus, for some reason, says, I'm giving you this part of the Holy Spirit, even though you're doing it in part. But He said, I'm going to give you something greater than your gift. And then He said, that greatest of this is love. So if you want to call it a gift, the greatest gift you can have is the love of God. And that's when the Scripture comes and says that love covers a multitude of sins. Oh, you're kidding. And that's the reason I'm for the love of God covering your sin and covering my sin. So when we all fall short in operating in gifts or just life, the way we make it is because we cover each other in love. You might come to me and talk about one of my brother or sister in Christ. I don't care if it's true or not. I don't like it. It's because I'm going to cover you in love. Now I might go to you privately and say, what in the world are you thinking? Right? But I'm not going to receive an accusation against a brother or sister. I'm going to cover you in love. Just don't get us in too much trouble, okay? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because, but today, Christians want to say, well, I'm going to expose their sin. I'm going to, I think they all need to be exposed. That concept makes me want to throw up. It's nothing but pride and arrogance. We need to cover each other in love. When we're in sin, you go to each other and say, I think you need to look at this. Broadcast to the world our sin. Okay, God, I'll hush. I get angry on that topic. I really do. He says there's something that's staying that's greater. It's called the love of God. I'm not condoning sin, but I am condoning the love of God. And we need to look after each other and cover each other. Do the best we can. And whatever you do, don't sin so much that we all have to look like a bunch of idiots to, to be on your side. Okay? But let's love each other. And as we're doing all of these gifts in part, we've got to have a lot of grace and mercy. On our best day, everybody wants their prophecies to be 100%. Well, on the best day, according to this, your prophecy is not going to be 100%. It's going to be in part. Well, what about the Old Testament where it says you have to be perfect in prophecy? The only thing I can do is give you a, what's called a latter mention of prophecy, and here it is, you're in part. Now, look at it just a little further here before y'all don't love me no more. It says, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. So there will be a day that the gifts won't be needed, and I hope you're getting that, because we're going to be like Him. We won't be in part anymore. We're in 100% agreement with Jesus Himself. He goes on to say this in Acts 2.19, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire, vapor, smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood. Before that great and notable day of the Lord comes. Has this happened yet? No. Now this is the last part of the prophecy of Joel. This part hasn't happened yet. The outpouring of the Spirit has. And, and, and he goes on to say, I don't know if I covered that. Did I? Uh, we like him, man. Uh, let me see right here. There's one other point. Can y'all tolerate me just a second? I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see vision. Your older men shall dream dreams. All my servants, all my handmaidens, I will pour out my spirit in those days. You see that? They should all prophesy. Now you need to understand something. I spoke to you before at the beginning of this teaching how that God speak, spoke to the nation Israel, then the, the nation Israel was to speak to the world what God was thinking. And this prophecy of Joel, it starts expanding. It says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Well, that's to a Jew, you're like, whoa. 
Whoa here. Sons and daughters, they're not prophets. Do you, do you notice something change shifting here? It, it's not shift, it's not changing, it's broadening. That's what God does. He, he's broadening it. Here he says that your sons and your daughters will pro- your young man will see visions, your old man dream dreams. Well, to a Jew, that's almost blasphemous. The, you mean the common? You mean everybody? There, do you see why the Jews were having a problem? You see, they didn't understand this prophecy of Joel that Peter was preaching until Peter preached it. And then all of a sudden they started rebelling. No. But it came out of their own Bible, their own Torah. But they didn't understand it. Here we see God's given revelation to, I'm going to broaden this beyond just Israel. Are you seeing it? Upon all flesh? Come on, somebody. You got to see this is devastating to the nation Israel. So they had to accept a lot. Jesus is the Messiah, plus God's going to go to the whole world with the gospel. Come on, Jesus, you're supposed to be happy. <laughs> right? They had a problem with it. And I'll tell you something else. They still got a problem with it. But I want you to understand why. Because what was happening. I, it just hit me. I, I, I don't know how I skipped that, but I did. <coughs> now, let me get back to where I was. <coughs> okay, we got into the wonders. Uh, it's not happened yet. End time events that are yet to come. The first part of the prophecy has just been announced the day of Pentecost. That's the first part. It was announced. How long does this last until the church is gone, the Harpazo? Now, so the first part of Joel continues on until that which is perfect comes. Then we're caught away with him. Gifts are not needed anymore. It's a good thing because the Holy Spirit is pulled out. Then the Holy Spirit's pulled out. Then the harpazo, that's the word people say the word rapture is not in the Bible. It's not, but the word harpazo is. That's where we get the word rapture. Harpazo is translated called up or called away. Five times out of 13 it appears in the Bible relating to the rapture. The other eight times it is translated to forcibly seize upon, snatch away, take to oneself or use force on someone. And I hear Bible teachers all the time say, well, rapture's not in the Bible, the whole continent. And I'm like, well, come on, just do a little bit of word study. Just a little bit of word study. It, it's right there. <coughs> and uh, so then in Acts chapter 2, verse 19, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, Sons and daughters shall prophesy, young men see vision, dream dreams. On my servants, handmaids, I'll pour out my spirit. And then I call, there's what Bible scholars call a parenthesis. This is the time of the Gentiles. That's the time in which we're living, is in this parenthesis time. Prophecy of Joel, halfway. All of a sudden, God sneaks in this thing called the church. In time of the Gentiles, he, it, it's the prophet. See the prophecy of Joel, the beginning half of Joel, has to embrace the parentheses. See the parentheses is all flesh. That's us. It it has to embrace the parentheses. The first part of Joel couldn't be true without the parentheses, because it leaves just the nation Israel. Into the all flesh arena. Do, do y'all see that? Now, the book of Acts for 30 years is dealing with the all flesh concept that was introduced in the first part of the prophecy of Joel. So then Paul is raised up. Now, you thought talking about throwing a kink in the water hose. Paul's raised up, the chief of sinners, and he goes running around. Uh, you know, with his TikTok videos, doing all that he's doing, writing all of this scripture and throwing it out there. And then Peter was having trouble with it. God gave Peter a dream that came about the Gentiles. He said, okay, okay, God, what Peter's, what Paul's saying is scripture. Oh my goodness. 
So Paul, Peter has accepted his scripture, and, but what I'm wanting you to see is the struggle of the nation Israel with the concept of all flesh. But what I also want you to understand, before God chose Abraham in the Jewish nation, pre-Abraham was a time of the grace of God. Pre-Abraham. In other words, God dealt with the world. God dealt with all flesh. He came to Noah and he came to this and he came to that one when he chose to do it. For some reason he woke up one morning and said, okay, I'm going to do one man thing. So he did the one man thing, nation Israel. Now we find in the book of Acts, God snuck around, said, I'm going to do the old flesh thing again. <laughs> did you see that? And so the nation Israel was having a little bit of a problem with it. But once you see how God lays it out, it's like, God, you are so sharp. Because Satan was following the storyline. He entered Judas and had the king killed. Uh, he didn't know the mystery. He didn't know God's little secret. And we're living in the secret. We're products of the secret. We have made, it has been made so easy for us. It's been made so easy to us. How can I say it? There's there's things happening in our nation today that, and this I know this is a, a, a maybe a hot topic, but if you allow people into your nation and you give them everything, they have no incentive to be anything. If you're raising your children and you give them everything, they will have no incentive to be anything. We have been born into the kingdom of God when nothing is required of us, but yet we get everything. We are living in a time that we can be the sorriest people of God that's ever been on the planet. But we have the greatest opportunity of any of God's people that's ever been on the planet. Will we wake up and see our privilege? Will we wake up and seize the moment of our privilege? that we have to do nothing to, but, to, but to grab that that we've inherited in Christ and go. Take the world for Christ. Will we please not be snotty-nosed kids of God that's been spoiled rotten by the privilege that we have in the grace of God? I think that was a plea of the Holy Spirit. You judge it. You test it. Let's stand. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you for this day. I do ask and pray, O oh God, that if anything I've said is not of you, it'd fall to the ground. If anything that I've said of you is true, I pray it'll be quickened to our hearts. Please help us, O oh God, not to stand before you daily as snotty no Christian kids, spoiled rotten by all of your blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Please help us to repent and help us to rejoice in what you've given us the opportunities you've given us. Let us seize the moment for the kingdom. Let us hush about our complaining. Let us speak out of our hearts, O oh God, your word and your promises, not our doubts, but your promises. Be with us this day in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.